May I hear this? You're rather lucky I didn't come with any prepared notes, but mainly some of the thoughts that we find that the 20,000 visitors to the embassy in Washington each year, uh, the sort of things that they ask us and the, uh, the old faithful questions. So I thought I might run through a few facts first, assuming you have a, uh, some brief knowledge of Australia and maybe see if your questions uh, might not be more interesting to yourselves than just hearing me rattle on uh, without statistics. These days, uh, there are about 300 people in the Australian Embassy at Washington, and this is a disproportionate amount of, uh, of effort for a nation of only 13 million. And the reason for this is that uh, the ties we have with America are getting bigger and bigger, and uh, the old kangaroo, koala bear bit, uh, is still relevant, but it's a long way from the uh, the sort of things that are happening now between our two countries. And the reason there are so many people over there, uh, me being one of the junior ones, uh, falls in three or four main areas. Uh, very briefly, trade is big these days. Uh, you sell us about a billion dollars worth of goods and we give you about half a billion back, so you're well ahead there. And uh, I hate to say it, in Iowa uh, we sell you an awful lot of meat, but maybe some of you know that already. So trade is one thing, and this is going to get very big, and the implications of this uh, are going to, uh, I think, create quite a few uh, debates, if not uh, controversies, between the countries uh, as time goes on. Uh, those Australians who are here may have already told you that uh, in many areas uh, Australia is becoming Americanized. That's a harsh way of putting it. Let's just say a lot of culture goes across the Pacific very quickly. And uh, if you're living over there, you stand a fair chance of turning on the television set and seeing uh, Mod Squad or Gunsmoke or uh, down a Sesame Street if, you, if you're that level. The American scene is very big there. Uh, it goes all the way through from the car makers, who are predominantly American, uh, down to Holiday Inn, who are just moving in, God help us. Uh, Colonel Sanders uh, is doing very, uh, very, very well in Australia. These are just a few examples. On the broad picture, it amounts to about 600 American companies with some interest in Australia, and around about three billion or more American dollars invested there. Uh, and as you can imagine, this occasionally stimulates the same sort of uh, arguments that the Canadians have had about, you know, excessive foreign domination or uh, whatever emotional language you want to use. But I think you're going to find, those of you who have some contact with Australians, that uh, what used to be a fairly uncritical, friendly, uh, good-natured relationship from here on is going to be uh, going to have elements of uh, uh, well, debates about the choirs and the word you're going to get for it. Things have changed a little from the uh, tourist and the koala bear image. The, the fact that we're drawing together and that there are so many uh, interests on both sides that are going to be in conflict means that it's worthwhile, for example, for people like myself to uh, try and explain some of these things before uh, all of a sudden old friends are uh, snapping at each other. I mentioned tourism. Last year, despite the distance to Australia, about 85,000 Americans went to Australia as tourists. And, uh, that, of course, uh, brings back people who are informed in a, in a certain degree. So you're going to get a lot of people, a lot of your neighbours, uh, a lot of friends who are going to you know, start treating Australia as, uh, uh, <laughs> as something other than uh, the place down under with the crazy animals. Uh, Dennis mentioned immigration. Last year there were about 7,000 Americans migrated to Australia. And on the past figures, we know that about three quarters of those will stay as permanent settlers. This brings the post-war figure uh, to about 30,000 American migrants. This is the increase is a phenomenon of the last two or three years. Uh, whether it's 
entirely the mindless sort of uh, decision that I think I saw in the cartoon in um, Berry is one of the political cartoonists, isn't he? This was in the Springfield paper yesterday with a couple of uh, obviously young fat cat Republicans sitting in their armchairs saying we're booked passage to Australia on November 8 if McGovern wins the election. Uh, I hope we don't attract people for that sort of reasons. There are other areas that bring us together ever since uh, I think we first fought together or had to fight together in the Boxer Rebellion and of course in every major war since then. And uh, a lot of the people in our embassy are with defence. We have uh, several treaties with yourselves. We buy a lot of our hardware from America. So these are just a few of the, that's part of the broad picture. And all these figures are increasing. The tourism, for example, was up 30% last year. There are expansion figures in almost every activity that our two nations have. Uh, some of you uh, would probably know that there are a lot of American teachers in Australia who have been recruited to go out on a two-year contract when some idiot ten years ago in Australia didn't put enough kids through the... Uh, this, the high school, uh, you know, science teaching, and uh, uh, you know, we find we're short. We've got an awful lot of liberal arts teachers, but not enough uh, science teachers. Things like this. So that's another scene. So if you went there, uh, and I think my Australians in the audience would agree, you'd uh, you'd see an awful lot of uh, uh, not only superficial but fairly deep strains running right through the Australian community, which would be a reflection and uh, a parallel in many ways with your own culture here. There are a lot of differences, but uh, I think that probably of the English-speaking nations, our two countries are probably closest together in uh, many broad attitudes and approaches to, uh, to things generally. There are a lot of other, a lot of other things I could say. Uh, historically, for example, uh, I found out today just by coincidence that uh, Mr. Dubuque, if that's the right pronunciation, who was allegedly the first Iowan uh, in 1788, I think he persuaded the Indians to let him mine some lead uh, somewhere. And 1788, by coincidence, was the year that Australia was founded. Uh, those of you with a sense of irony you would usually get a laugh by knowing that uh, your war of liberty, which persuaded the British to move elsewhere, resulted in us getting, getting started a few years later as a British jail because the convicts that the British had in uh, Georgia, Maryland, went back on the prison ships in the Thames River and uh, when, they, when they started to smell so bad they decided to get rid of them. And at that stage Australia was the end of the world and uh, that's where they sent them. So uh, we, got, we got started as a British colony because you threw the British out. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lesson there somewhere. Um, Americans have been around a long time in Australia. The, the gold rush has brought them there in tens of thousands and many of them stayed. But it wasn't really until the Second War when the British, who had been uh, our uh, big daddy for, for those 150 years, and until the British influence and the British Empire had obviously uh, retreated back in its box, that. Uh, we discovered fairly belatedly that uh, we were a Pacific nation and uh, not merely an appendage of Britain on the other side of the world. And our actions since then have uh, generally been directed to try and emphasize that uh, we do speak English, but we're an independent nation. We gained, incidentally, uh, our independence peacefully, the British, I think, were tired of fighting, so they handed over in stages. And when we federated at the turn of this century, uh, we were liberal enough to uh, take not only the British parliamentary system of democracy, but to, uh, to steal some ideas from your own. So our federal parliament, for example, has a Senate and a House of Representatives, and the composition of these is virtually exactly the same style as your own system here. But it, as I say, it was uh, the fall of Singapore, I think, in 1942 that uh, forced Australia to stand away from Britain, stand on its own two feet, and 
despite what was a very small population in a nation that's almost exactly the size of the continental United States to uh, start making a lot of decisions for itself. As an example of what used to go on, we had no mission, uh, no diplomatic mission in Washington until 1940. Uh, the British used to kindly look after most of our interests overseas. But uh, we hope that these are, are things that are long gone. Without going on too far, the, some of you will know, uh, some of you may be interested to know, the, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the action here in various areas from women's lib, uh, you know, through ecology, through descent generally, uh, finds its way across the Pacific too. And this is an area where Australians were apathetic for a long time. Uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you, uh, you couldn't have had a debate in Australia on women's rights, or <laughs> would have been a one-sided sort of thing. Uh, now, of course, uh, Jermaine Greer is an Australian from my hometown. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, it's a country that, although small, has been very, f very fortunate with its resources generally, and it's a country that is coming out of uh, uh, far too many years under a benevolent umbrella that uh, I think inhibited its growth, uh, particularly on a, on a personal level. And uh, if you went down there, I think you'd find, I'm sh I don't know how long the Australians here have, have been here, possibly uh, only a couple of years, and they would know that there are now stirrings across Australia of the sort of things that have, uh, have been a very promising sign of in your nation for far longer. Now there are some very general thoughts. I don't know whether some of you might not like to, uh, to raise a few specifics. I don't like going too far. Uh, if you ask the questions, I know that's something you're <laughs> directly interested in. But beyond these general observations, if you have uh, specific inquiries, it might be more relevant if I can help you with those. Anyone have any general or otherwise questions? For God's sake, don't ask me how a little, little kid came in we had a show and uh, we have an animal called an echidna that looks like a porcupine. You know, he said, Mr. How much those porcupines weigh? <laughs> Yeah. Well, very briefly, Australia, of course, for 150 years was almost entirely rural and still very heavily dependent on the rural industries. Uh, meat, with the now the world's biggest meat exporter, a lot of uh, meat comes here. As I say, I hate to tell uh, people in the Midwest we sell you meat, but we do, uh, on a very rough figure, about one in 10 of your hamburgers is an Australian hamburger. So you've got the traditional staples of Australia, which have been wheat, wool, meat, dairy products. The manufacturing industries are now fairly big. They employ about a quarter of the workforce. And this goes all the way from 80,000 ton ships to about, I think, half a million vehicle units a year. And this is, in many ways, just like any highly developed industrialized Western nation with a few of the uh, curses that, that brings down on your head in the name of progress. But the biggest thing has been in the last 10 years a what you could I think safely call for once a fantastic series of mineral finds right around the nation from you know the desert areas right down to well just off my capital just off the town where I live Melbourne offshore they found uh, uh, very heavy, very heavy producing oil wells. We had no, no petroleum, nothing. And now we're supplying about 70% of our own needs. Uh, Australians are always good con men. And uh, we started an international nickel boom that uh, had, a few <laughs> had a few busts on the way. But we've found nickel in very large quantities, phosphates. Unlike the, uh, the sort of soil this uh, university is built on, which apparently goes down about 20 feet and is pretty good soil, Australian soils are poor. They're 
it's the oldest continent. Most of the trace elements, this sort of thing, you know, have been leached out of it just by billions of years of time. So we need phosphates, everything in Australia, pretty well any agriculture needs phosphates, and a lot of them need more than that. And uh, we used to have to get them from the Pacific. We found deposits of that. We found more aluminium than anyone we can use. We found, biggest thing of all, uh, littoral mountain ranges of iron ore. And we had enough for our own needs. We thought, well, uh, we have found iron out there that is literally pure ferrous oxide. In some cases, they don't even bother taking the overbird and they just uh, dynamite a few thousand tonnes down the cliff and put it straight into a train and off to Japan. Japan, uh, incidentally, by uh, another irony history, now being our major trading partner. We supply vast raw, raw materials to Japan, vast amounts for their manufacturing industries. And this list goes on. They keep finding things. The other day, for example, just one thing that stuck in my mind, uh, over in what was a desert area, you know, useful for nothing, they found uh, 50,000 million tons of marble. And I think they're already selling some to Italy. I think that's a nice touch. <laughs> and, and Israel. <laughs> but this this whole uh, resources scene has been the, uh, the biggest thing, I think, that short of its being founded and short of the gold rushes of the 1850s that finally got Australia accelerating away from the, uh, the British jail. But uh, what has happened in the last 10 years has been the biggest thing ever to happen to Australia in terms of its, its resources and wealth. And where it goes from here, uh, well, it's, uh, you can pick your own prediction. Uh, we're, we're supplying already uh, raw materials, you know, for a lot of important nations, including your own. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. How long does it take to Well, there's still after people. You can get a debate on this too. Uh, a lot of people question, you know, whether migration is the right thing to do. Uh, it, Australia still maintains a very high employment rate by world standards. At the moment, it's the worst it's been in 10 years because, like yourselves, we're climbing up out of this international monetary slump of the last couple of years. At the moment, it's about one point, sorry, 1.8 percent. And yours is running about, what, 6%, conceding that the statistics aren't exactly the same base. But we're still after people. Uh, well, they've always wanted professional people. There's no longer, in the early days after the war, when we took hundreds of thousands of d displaced people and, you know, we were just desperate for you know, for unskilled labour, well, the emphasis is not so much on this. These days we're particularly interested in people who have got, you know, skills that can be immediately applied to uh, Australia. Well, the whole communications uh, thing is very big in Australia. It's very prosperous, the advertising industry uh, does well, the, uh, the radio, radio is a particularly good uh, profit earner as far as the companies are concerned. Uh, and in this area there are, you know, the Americans go out occasionally, but it's pretty thriving, it, it always has been. We haven't got colour television, that's coming in I think March 75, but uh, it's a, you know, the whole communication bit is a very profitable area. No, there is a government funded organisation that's, uh, that's a bit like the BBC. It, it's a vast, it, as a matter of fact, it's the single biggest communications uh, employer in Australia, but it's uh, sufficiently independent to uh, be cursed regularly, uh, often by government uh, members of parliament who feel that it, uh, it's biased the other way. <laughs> so. Uh, that is one system. Every big Australian city has uh, has the radio television network with this semi-autonomous government standing. But the commercial ones, of course, are, it, it is usually outnumbered about three to one. 
most of the big cities have got about three or four television stations. And it's a pretty thriving sort of a, an industry. Yeah. You can argue this one too. Uh, you can, and you can pick your definitions. Probably the answer uh, is yes in almost you know, all fair definitions. There's a symphony orchestra which is part government funded in every one of the capital cities. And you, you must remember that almost all Australians live in six main cities around the coast. There's very few people inside. Uh, ballet, you know, we have now have a thriving national ballet company that uh, has toured the United States. The film industry is pretty depressed. There's, not, there's no Australian feature film industry as such. But the, uh, you know, there's a thriving, uh, you know, pop culture pretty well everywhere. And, uh, you know, in terms of the usual things like, you know, state libraries and state museums, uh, you know, these are, these are uh, in all the big cities. There is one thing uh, called the Sydney Opera House that I think you'll be hearing a bit of in the future. Uh, don't quote me, it'll be one of history's biggest boondoggles, but it will also be one of the great buildings of the world. Uh, uh, this is a building that looks a bit like three racing yachts gone mad, uh, and it's right next, it's in the heart, it's on a promontory in the heart of Australia's biggest city in Sydney Harbour. And it, and it looks like that. Uh, and it, it is going to be open next year. It's cost so far about 120 million American dollars. Um, the original estimate was about 20 million dollars. Uh, and the, uh, the biggest irony of all is that there's not one dollar of government money in it. It was paid for entirely by Australian lover gambling because it's been financed entirely by a state-run uh, lottery you know, 50 cents, take your chance for $100,000 or whatever. But uh, Australia is coming out of uh, what used to be very much the doldrums in this area. I mean, Errol Flynn was an Australian. <laughs> but so is Joan Sutherland and uh, a lot of people with uh, longer staying power than Errol Flynn. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't understand it. The salary of 8,000 Australian dollars would be a middle upper class salary. That's a good salary in Australia. The, at the moment, the average man is earning about or well, over 100 American dollars a week. Uh, this buys a lot more than it does in Australia, but it, it does not buy uh, the range of luxuries and so on that the mythical average American would enjoy. The Australian standard of living is not as high, generally speaking, in, in terms of you know the, the Australians in it, as yours, because yours is still the highest in the world. But it's not hard, generally speaking, to you know for a guy who wants to work. Uh, reasonably well, not hard to make a comfortable living in Australia. Uh, you know, most homes have got, almost all homes you could say have got you know, television set, car, washing machine, refrigerator. They may not have a second car or a boat. But price on average car. I think the, I've never had to buy one, thank heavens. I think what you'd call a compact car here, say a six-cylinder, eight-cylinder uh, Ford or a General Motors or a Chrysler car made in Australia would be uh, over $3,000 in Australia. It is costs a lot more in terms of um, man weeks necessary to work to, uh, to get it. You, you'll get a car far cheaper here simply because of the, the whole mass production bit. You're working, you're working on 205 million people and uh, we're working on 13 million. Uh, I think both governments are rough. 
Um, I, I'm sorry, income tax. I've been trying to get an answer out of our people in the embassy on this for about six months. It's very hard to compute it. Uh, I don't think you'd pay much less comparatively. On the, um, on the last figures I saw, and this was before our last election budget, uh, which was designed to, uh, we have an election in November, and it was a budget designed to encourage people to vote again for the government, if you know what I mean. Uh, before that, the average family man with uh, a couple of kids, after he took out all the relevant deductions and you know, this sort of thing, was paying about 16% of his salary uh, in income tax. But this leaves aside uh, things like property tax. Australians don't have property tax in the system. You know it. You, what, you might pay, what, $1,000 a year property tax? It's up in this area, I think. I believe that's right. Well, this, this usually goes, I believe, to help finance the state-run schools. Well, this doesn't figure in Australia. They get the money another way. Uh, it makes it, you know, you might pay, well, I pay about $77 property tax, which is for my local municipal authority to cart away my garbage and clean my streets and this sort of thing. But uh, when you look at it overall, it's a, as I say, it's a highly developed consumer society and uh, with a big bureaucracy and the, the tax, uh, the income tax is you know, a significant part of it as it is here. I'm sorry, I didn't... I don't get it, but I think you're asking, is there a, a scale of taxation? I didn't quite hear it, but I, I think, um, sure, once you get once you get up into a high income level, uh, the government takes an ever increasing cut. I think I think it only goes up to about sixty six percent, but uh, that's that's when you need good tax lawyers. But th this is the same anywhere. You know, the the theory, of course, being that the uh, the low income earner doesn't get uh, taxed as heavily. We better make this off the record too, or I'll get shot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I got I got sentenced uh, sentenced for two years as the national public relations officer or whatever is with our national weather service, uh, and this is a it was a, I was on a s assigned you know to a, a sister department. And that, that is the definition of the impossible job. M making weather is popular. Ooh, I could give you one man who'd tell you very quickly. It might be better if we talk later on that one because it's not, a, not of general interest. Uh, fairly reasonable, I would say. There's a hell of a lot of exchange for two countries. Yes, ma'am. Turn off the bugs. Uh, I would say for leaving aside, you know, the question of whether a, you know a married guy in his 50 should take his family down. I would say certainly if you were young, uh, married or single, and uh, particularly if you can get onto one of the, in effect, a free passage that the government, the Australian government gives to about one third of the people who come from America. I'd say it could be a great experience and you can always come back. As, you know, I wouldn't, and this is what a lot of people are doing, a lot of younger people. I don't think so. It, it's, it's not across the board, it's about a third. I, I think if they, if they figure that, um, you know, you're a reasonably sincere applicant and you have particular skills. What, well, it works out, I, I think, about, it's roughly, it's one in three. In other words, uh, you know, two and a half thousand out of seven and a half thousand. I'm not an immigration expert, I'm a generalist, which is a dangerous thing. But 
once again, I can, if you'd like to see me later, I can tell you, you know, where you can write to if there's something hard on that. Yeah. I hope they do. Uh, there are very few group tours and excursion rates available on the Pacific because, um, you know, the uh, the big companies uh, seem to be running it on a, you know, pretty pretty tight uh, basis. I'm sure they will move into this area, and uh, it's obviously needed because the fares are so high. You know, you're going to pay um, 650, 700, say seven, at least 700 American dollars for a one-way ticket. Whereas, of course, uh, we, or you can get to Europe, or Australians can get to Europe for far less just because of the volume of traffic. Yeah. No, I think they're still recruiting. It depends. Um, they do have a sort of a book on what qualifications are accepted. But once again, um, I think I've got some rubbish in the bag there and I can tell you to whom to write with an application or with the further information. Teaching in Australia is, is broadly speaking on a state, you know, the six states uh, run their own programs. It doesn't go down to the county level. They go all over. A lot of them, um, I think, often by choice. Maybe they twist their arms when they get there, but a lot of them go to um, what you'd call uh, provincial towns, you know, 50,000, 20,000. Fifteen, and I think the qualifications are accepted uh, around the world. Oh, the, whole, the whole thing, you can take your pick. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure of the university position at the moment. Uh, once again, I can put you on a mailing list. Of the we get a certain amount of information on the positions vacant in universities. S sorry, Dennis. Yeah, no troubles. So, yes. Well, a lot more moderate than you'd get here. Australia, as you mainly know, the, you know, enjoys fairly hot weather. None of the capital cities ever has snow in any form. Uh, your winter temperatures, even in the south, are going to be maybe 50 degrees, 45 degrees. Uh, but the heat, very generally speaking, when you consider that most Australians live in uh, one blob in the lower right-hand corner, <laughs> uh, in that sort of area, it's a fairly temperate climate, y you're going to get dry heat. The humi you won't get terrible humidity as, for example, you get in Washington or even, you know, even inland here. And the seasons are exactly reversed. But, you know, you're going to have a climate where you can go and play golf all year round, uh, this sort of thing. Yeah, you can go and break your neck skiing, but you've got to climb up the mountain. The, as I say, there are no, uh, none of the big cities ever get snow in any form, but there is a vast acreage of uh, ski skiable country if you want to ski. Well, yeah, they have two, um, two of the international races are held there each year. Yes, ma'am. Textile industry manufacturing. Well, it's fairly big, as you know. We uh, we have about 160 million sheep, and uh, <laughs> it it goes on from there. Uh, Australia makes you know very much of its own textiles, of its own cloths, and its own garments. It has quite a thriving fashion industry as well. It's uh, pretty well self-sufficient in these sort of areas. 
you know, we make everything from carpet onwards. That's a very rough answer. Yeah. Well, you can, you can throw away about a third of it uh, as far as any, uh, any land management goes. It might have minerals, but approximately a third of Australia is uh, desert, if you regard desert as a, broadly speaking, as anything that gets less than about 10 inches of rain a year. About another third is uh, semi-arid. You know, you'll have a lot of cattle grazing but you might have one, uh, one steer every 10 acres. There was a National Geographic film in Australia. I was having a fluke on last night at, uh, at Springfield and uh, they were talking to one character there and his, um, his cattle ranch was uh, 1,117 square miles and uh, you need that sort of country to, to get a modest uh, herd up. But, and the rest of it, the remaining third is useful in you know in all sorts of degrees from heavily irrigated country through to you know modestly uh, yielding areas but uh, as i said compared to what you have around here uh, australia is very poorly off as far as its uh, its soils and so on go and in fact in many areas australian uh, soil scientists have had to uh, been forced to uh, pioneer new ways to try and get some, some yield out of these uh, fairly unrelenting acres. Yeah. Oh, complete. Complete. Yeah. The flying doctor's an old favourite, you know, the poor stockman breaks his leg and uh, they get on the radio and some poor cow gets dragged out of bed and flies you know, 1,500 miles or 1,000 miles or whatever. No, the medical facilities are good. There's no um, very little of what you'd call a national health system, nothing like the British system. Uh, there's government assistance in a lot of areas, but the average Australian, uh, like myself, uh, goes out and ensures himself with something like Blue Cross. Yeah. Well, uh, I think, you know, without it being on paper, they'd um, probably figure that people who were evading responsibilities, you know, may not have been the sort of people they're after. I don't think it's ever been defined, but I would think that would be the sort of attitude. I, d I, d I can't remember anyone being turned over, but you know, you'd have to, it'd be, it's very hard to get to Australia. Uh, you can't, you know, just cross a border. It's a big journey and you're not going to get immigration papers and this sort of thing. I don't think they'd be particularly thrilled. Yeah. Uh, these days with, uh, I don't know, you call it ZPG here, I guess, do you? Not ZPG. <laughs> you can get shot for saying there should be more. A lot of economists figure around 30 million people by the turn of the century. 30, 3, 0. See, 13, 1, 3. So it's a, just a few more than the population of Illinois. Or about the same as the population of greater New York over an area the size of the United States. I'm sorry? No, there never was. Um, this is a part of this uh, last frontier myth that uh, we started with. Um, you've always had to pay for land in Australia. A few guys who got in early in the 1830s managed to grab a bit of it, but in the end the government got something out of them. There is la land is opened occasionally for bidding or for grant. Uh, but you're not, 
there was never anything that you would regard as a homesteading act. Yeah. Yep, um, you're eligible. I'm not exactly sure on this, on the age limits. Uh, see, our draft is at age 20. It's, a, it's only a, dra it's a draft of about, about 8,000 people at the moment. Uh, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not exactly sure the age cutout that would, you know, guarantee you immunity. Same thing happens here. I had a, I had a friend years ago went to, live in, uh, went to live in New York with his parents and he, he spent the next three years living in Germany. <laughs> Probably about, I think, the same sort of investment. Australians have got a bit of a thing about houses. Uh, most of them, when you get married, they tend to uh, to head out in the uh, in the sticks and uh, get themselves a quarter acre of land and a three bedroom brick or brick veneer house. Uh, this, this is a stereotype. It's very largely true. There's not nowhere near the same emphasis on apartment living or other alternatives as there is here. It's growing, but the average young Australian will go and maybe get married. The, I think the, the men are marrying at about age 24 at the moment. Um, but he'll spend the next 25 years of his life uh, paying off the mortgage on his house. Uh, a house in Australian terms, you can go and get a, you know, a, a, well, let's talk about old houses or 20, 30 year old houses. You can get a sturdy, three bedroom brick or brick veneer, which is a, a brick facing house within a reasonable limit in the big cities, in the biggest cities where the money is higher for maybe um, 15 to $20,000. But that's all housing is <laughs> terrible generalization, but it's, a, it's, it's still of course the single biggest investment you're ever gonna make in your life. But uh, the, uh, with this tradition of owning a house, most people seem to, one way or another, get around to uh, paying off the, the block of land and the, the house they're on. Yeah. The bank interest rate? The bank interest rate? What, say, for a savings account? Or I'm trying to think. My father's a bank manager. Maybe I got a special deal, but I think I'm, I think I'm paying about six percent on the uh, the place that I have. It depends on what you can negotiate and on what down payment you make and things like that. I think it's around six percent. Yeah. I think anyone with a professional degree is uh, is a long way towards uh, being seriously considered. We have a lot of agricultural colleges, but uh, you know, this is an area where so much has to be done. That it's it has been suffering a little, generally speaking, in the last um, four or five years. You know the synthetics built the hell out of wool for a while, but wool seems to have picked up. They, uh, they introduced, a, the government introduced a marketing scheme and they've, uh, you know, there's more than they, uh, more people want it than they have wool at the moment. Beef is picking up, beef is doing very well. When the Argentinians got uh, foot and mouth disease in their herds, um, this put Australia into the position of being the world's biggest exporter of beef, uh, wheat, is uh, that we've had a drought, and Australian agriculture is uh, full of perils in a lot of areas. You know, it's marginal country. You just suffer the uh, the curses of the climate, you know, which come in random intervals. Uh, agriculture is still a still a pretty reasonable way of making a living. They complain a lot, but uh, there are not too many people leaving the land. They've, in one big way, many people have changed 
from being the wool producers through to beef. And this was unfortunate that the world needed beef. It looks like that will continue for a fair while. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear. on the immigration policy. Well, this has always been a policy based on a people who are going to be predominantly Caucasian. And uh, although these days about one in 16 migrants is non-European, and this could be anything through from an American Negro to an Indian, Pakistani, Salamese, Hong Kong, Chinese, uh, it's still going to be a small ratio in terms of overall migration. Uh, for the reason, broadly speaking, that you know, a country that is historically populated you know, from Europe and most of our post-war immigration, this has been a, you know, two, and a half, two and a half million people, has come from Europe. And uh, they want to be sure that anyone who comes in of whatever colour or whatever is going to uh, you know, stand a fair chance of, within one generation, integrating you know, completely into the Australian system and as a result the preponderance of people coming in are Caucasian but it's not exclusive because about one in the last, the last figure I saw I think was uh, well I worked it out but it was one in 15 was not of European stock pardon one in 15 sorry that's that's the cold and everything that's one five Well, a lot of professions are open uh, as long as you don't produce any geologists here because uh, when we had this mineral thing I was speaking of, yeah, everyone, wow, yeah, st straight into geology with the obvious result, it's a fairly low employment field. Uh, these things fluctuate as you know, I mean the fact that we're taking American teachers at the moment is you know, because of another fluctuation uh, in the decision some years ago. And uh, I'm not fully familiar with the pattern, but as I said, professional people are wanted, and that's about the short term answer. But it's pretty easy. There are it's half a dozen air letters to the right sources, you know, will give you an answer, an up to date answer in your field uh, fairly quickly. Fine, well, if there are no more, thanks very much for listening patiently. If any of you want to have a chat later, you're welcome to. And uh, any of you coming through Washington, you might like to come and have a look at the fabulous embassy the Australian taxpayers built for us. Thank you very much.